Welcome to the very first video from Valence Electrical Training Services. My name is Chris Wurstjuk and I am the author of the Relay Testing Handbook. The Relay Testing Handbook is a 656 page book that is designed for relay testers so that they can understand how the elements work in a relay and how to test them rather than the typical electrical engineering book which was designed for engineers. Now this book was actually based on a paper that I wrote for the NIDA conference in 2001. And seeing how this is the first video, I thought I would do the very first presentation that was the foundation of the Relay Testing Handbook. Now you have to remember this was in 2001 and people were kind of confused about what digital relays did, how they were going to test them. And a lot of people would actually go through the manufacturer's book, uh, the manufacturer's test instructions in the back of the book to test the relays. Now in 2013, people pretty much have got the idea that they want to test whatever's turned on in the element and they should be testing the relay with the as-built settings. The topic today will be understanding microprocessor-based relay logic. And I'm not going to use the word microprocessor anymore. I'm going to use the word digital because that's what we say now. And in order to understand digital-based relay logic, you really have to go back to the foundations, which is the history of protective relays. So protective relays are designed to protect equipment and personnel from electrical faults. And they're also designed to isolate to minimize system disruptions. So if you have a fault on one feeder, only that feeder gets isolated and not the rest of the protective system. The first relays were electromechanical. So they used magnetism and mechanisms in order to work. And then along came solid state relays, which were designed to be direct replacements for the electromechanical relays. Then simple microprocessor relays came out, and those microprocessor relays did the same thing as the solid-state relays, except they used a microprocessor instead of solid-state components. And then the complex multifunction microprocessor relays that we use today became uh, Vogue, and now they're pretty much installed just about everywhere. So when you talk about electromechanical relays, they use magnetism and mechanics, and the setting, the first primary setting was probably a tap setting. So you had a specific magnitude of current. And then most relays had timing disks, and you change the time delays by changing the distance that that, that, that disk had to turn. And then some elements had clapper-style coils, so that you, if enough current operated, it would pull a clapper up. And then you would have targets to tell you which relays operated. Some of the positives for electromechanical relays were they're simple to install, their uh, configuration was pretty basic for the most part, and testing them was relatively simple because every CO9 relay in the world should operate exactly the same, so the testing procedures could be standardized. It was easy fault troubleshooting. When the relay went bad, you could look at everything that was going on inside that can, and you could figure out what, what the problem was and whether you could fix it or not. And that's the same thing with transparent operation. They were very rugged and reliable, and there have been relays that have been in service for over 50, 60 years. I personally have tested a relay that was installed sometime in the 1940s, and it was still working perfectly. The negatives, there were limited output contacts, there was a larger footprint on the, in the actual panel, and it was subject to environmental conditions. So if the temperature got too hot or there was dirt or dust, such as a mining installation, or moisture and cor corrosion, such as a, um, a hydro dam or something like that, all of those things could affect the operation of the relays and make them not ever work at all, which is something that most electrical, or, uh, sorry, electromechanical relay testers find, is every once in a while you'll find the relay that just does not trip. So after electromechanical relays had been in service for decades and solid state components started to get used, the idea was is we're going to take all of that analog stuff and we're going to do it digital using electronic components. But it was really based on the electromechanical relays, so they weren't that complex. The positives were they were just as easy to install as electromechanical relays, and often many of these solid state relays could be installed into the same can as an electromechanical relay, so it actually made everything cheaper. The configuration and testing, the settings were almost identical to electromechanical relays, so it was easy for everybody to understand how they worked. There was easy fault troubleshooting, so you could, uh, there was only one component per phase, so if something went wrong, you could just take that phase out. And they were cheaper, lighter, and sometimes you could get three elements inside one, one box. 
The negatives is they had a lot of problems with harmonics and power supply failures. The worst thing about solid state relays were that they would fail and there would be no way that you would know until you did your triannual maintenance or whatever. And there was often no indication. So there was no warning lights. There was no self-checking, any of those things. And they often didn't have a lot of contacts because they were designed to directly replace electromechanical relays and capacitors would blow up inside. So these solid state relays kind of killed, um, because they were so unreliable, a lot of people in the industry would not install them after they installed them once. And it actually hampered the growth of relay advancement for like a decade before uh, Schweitzer and other manufacturers finally were able to break through the stigma created by solid state relays. So you can see that the relays in these pictures, we have uh, the front panel where you apply your settings and then you have the circuit of how this relay is actually supposed to work. And then we have the DC schematic, which is pretty much the same as the electromechanical schematic. After a while, they started coming out with simple microprocessor relays or digital relays. And again, we had analog to digital channel converters. But instead of using solid state components, there was a microprocessor that controlled everything. And these early relays didn't have a lot going for them. They basically made, uh, you took three, three or four relays and you could put them all in one box. They're pretty relatively easy to install because they were single element things. You still had an overcurrent relay that would test A phase, B phase, C phase, and ground. Or it was a voltage relay that tested all three phases. They, they typically were single function relays. And one of the benefits is they had metering built in. So you could walk by and see exactly what was going on. They have an LCD display. You could communicate with these relays. So they were slightly more complex or there were a little more settings. So communication was often a benefit so that you could actually set the relay up instead of going through the three buttons on the front panel. And they finally had self-checks. So they could self-check themselves and uh, they could find most of the problems and warn the operators. The negatives is they weren't often as reliable as electromechanical relays. Sometimes they required frequent firmware updates. So somebody would have to go back and reinstall the firmware and retest the relay, which is a, can be a significant expense. And they didn't have the very many output contacts again. And that's what a, uh, a block diagram of what a microprocessor relay actually does. So you have your analog to digital converters on the left. All those signals go into the microprocessor, which makes decisions based on settings. And that microprocessor will send output signals on the right. Then came relays like Schweitzer or ABB, the SEL311 series, for example, or the RHEL series. And these relays took a fundamental shift in how they were going to protect the system. Every relay that came before these complex digital relays was a single element thing. It was either an overcurrent relay or it was a voltage relay. These complex relays they would protect a device so they would protect a feeder or they'd protect a generator or they'd protect a transmission line and they would have all of the elements that you would need to protect that particular device so they were much much more complex operation wise they still used analog to digital converters and then a microprocessor to review those signals and then make decisions based on the settings they were multifunction, so you could get a lot of functions in one box that is very much cheaper than getting a single relay for every phase and every element. The outputs were flexible, so if you decided to go crazy, you could make a very complex scheme that, that would protect your system. It had metering built into it. They're cheaper. They have an L Most of them have an LCD display so that you can actually see what's going on without having to pull out your laptop and communicate to it. And if you did want to pull out your laptop, you could use the laptop communications. There were self-checks. And the most important thing is there was an invent report. So whenever you could actually program the relay to monitor the system and then record everything that happened, and then you could look at the event report and see that, oh, yes, I do have a lot of over voltages whenever this, or sorry, under voltages whenever this motor starts. Maybe I should look at something to do with, uh, with uh, the motor starting. For example, some of the negatives are you needed to do frequent firmware updates for some models of relays, which again requires reprogramming the relay and then retesting it. 
The setup and installation is can be very complex. Sometimes it's very easy, but if you have an engineer who really knows his stuff, he can make a very complicated scheme. You can have very frustrating fault troubleshooting, trying to figure out why you can't talk to that relay with your laptop. Back in 2001, it, communications protocols weren't that standardized, so you could after, actually spend more time trying to talk to a relay than, than it, it took to actually test it. Another problem is you're putting all of your eggs in one basket. So before you had an A phase relay, a B phase relay, and a C phase relay, and a neutral. And if you wanted to test that particular feeder protection system, you could pull out A phase and you'd still be protected by the neutral. And then the same thing for B phase and C phase. And when you pulled the neutral, you'd still be protected by one of the individual phases. So you didn't have to take a shutdown in order to test that relay. Also, if the A phase relay went bad, you could find a spare and put it in. Often, we don't have a lot of spares for our protective relays, so that isn't available anymore, and sometimes you lose protection, and then you lose whatever that device was protecting until you can get a replacement. And the worst case of digital relays is the documentation is typically horrible. One of my biggest pet peeves is that the only way you know what this relay is programmed to do is if you actually talk to it and understand that system of output logic or settings. So it really, really frustrates me when you come to a site and the only way that anybody could know how that relay operates is if they're a professional or an expert in that particular relay. So that's uh, a Schweitzer SEL 311C. And the nice thing about Schweitzer is they typically put the wiring diagram right on the back, which makes it a lot easier for us relay testers. And then here is the block diagram, which is very similar to the previous block diagram that I showed. Now, when we're comparing generations, the top left-hand side, that's an electromechanical DC schematic. You can see that every relay is individual, and I can pop each relay out one at a time and not affect anything else. Whereas the drawing on the bottom right, that's the electromechanical relay, and all it says is out one to the trip coil. So if I don't understand that relay, I don't understand what is actually going to make it trip. Where with the electromechanical relay, I can go step by step and see that an A phase 51 and an A phase 50 will both cause a, the, the breaker to trip.